very pleased to be here. I'm, I'm sorry I can't see you, but um, I'm glad that we are all together on this, I think, very important topic, uh, but also a difficult one. What I want to do is, is look, first of all, about what the concept of hate speech is understood, at least by some. Um, also to look at a related concept of hate crime, which is not exactly the same, although they're, they're closely linked. And then look at some other problems which arise um, when you're particularly, you're trying to balance it, hate speech against the rights of freedom of expression and some of the problems which have arisen specifically as a result of coronavirus. Now, hate speech, if you look at international instruments, uh, and I'm focusing primarily on European standards, although, much of what I say is relevant to more international standards as well. It's only mentioned in two instruments, a uh, recommendation of the Committee of Ministers from 1997 and the general policy recommendation number 15, which Mara mentioned. That's the only actual use of hate speech. Other instruments tend to talk about uh, formulation of advocacy of hatred, dissemination of ideas based on superiority, the dissemination of racist and xenophobic material those kind of approaches. And the European Court of Human Rights, which often refers to hate speech, has actually never said what it means. I mean, there are a lot of cases where hate speech is mentioned, but if you try to understand what it means, it has never formulated a def definition. But when you look at the, the circumstances in which hate speech occurs, you see there are certain common elements. So basically expression which promotes or supports the denig denigration, hatred or vilification or prejudice against persons on account of certain personal characteristics or a particular status, as well as insulting or negative stereotyping by reference to that characteristic or status. Now, most of the standards which exist dealing with hate speech tend to focus on quite a restricted range of characteristics, namely color, ethnic or national origin, descent, language, nationality, race, and religion. Um, the your, G GPR number 15 is quite different in that it covers a much, it's a non-exhaustive list, first of all, which means that actually you can develop the idea of what hate speech might cover, but it specifically refers to age, disability, sex, gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. So it's quite different from other instruments. Expression for this purpose covers speech, but any form of publication, the use of electronic media, um, but it can also take in terms of pictures, um, music, plays, videos, and even conduct. Um, in addition to these things, generally hate speech will be seen as covering also the public denial, trivialization, and justification of crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes, uh, and also the glorification of persons who have committed such crimes. Um, you see this, there are mixed instruments which have different elements, uh, some of these things, but not all of them have them. Um, at the international level, the main instruments are Article 3 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, Article 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 4 of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and quite a lot of recommendations of the Committee of Ministers. And also at the international level, the Rabbit Plan of Action, and there is a degree of overlap between the Rabbit Plan of Action and GPR number 15. Not all states are happy with hate speech. So for example, if you look at the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, there are several states which have made reservations to Article 4. Uh, they take a strong view of freedom of expression, and therefore they're not willing um, to accept readily um, the way in which its uh, action is required against it in Article 4. Um, but when you look at all the definitions, whatever they are, what is clear is that hate speech is fundamentally inconsistent with the, the pluralism that is essential for a democratic state, and that effective action both to prohibit such expression and to counter its harmful effects has to be taken by public authorities, and the media need to contribute to that. Now, when I say it's to probe it, I'm not necessarily talking about criminal sanctions, we'll come back to that issue, but taking action against the use of hate speech is important. In terms of the standards, what is particularly important is I think that with both the European Convention on Human Rights and ECRI, you have much more active follow-up 
about what states are doing. So therefore, they're much better ways of trying to look at problems involved in the use of hate speech. This is less true of some of the other instruments where the, the, the standards are important, but there are much weaker means of supervising them. We turn from hate speech to hate crime. That is a term which is not actually found in any international or regional instrument, but it's concerned normally, but not exclusively, with behavior that is or should be criminal, but there is a factor which is added to that behavior. Um, that is, so there is the motivation uh, which will require that the behavior to be criminalized in a particular way. And the motive derives from the negative attitude on the part of the perpetrator, generally a form of bias, intolerance, racism, and xenophobia. So very similar language to, to hate speech towards some personal characteristic or status of the victim, which he or she shares with others. So generally speaking, it's because the victim identifies with a particular group of persons. But the European Court has made it clear that it actually it can go wider than that. Um, and you may find that um, there are other factors uh, which lead to it being covered. Um, the exception from the, the general definition of hate crime is in Article 4 of the Additional Protocol to the Convention of Cybercrime, because this is different from all the other provisions dealing with hate crime in that it's not dealing with something which is normally an offense. So generally speaking, for example, if I hit somebody, uh, that's an assault or if I damage someone's property. But it becomes hate crime if I do it because I'm motivated by um, some prejudice against that person because of his link with a particular group. But the additional protocol to the Convention of Cybercrime requires particular behavior to be criminalized. Uh, so if you have uh, a threat to commit a serious offense made through a computer system, uh, regardless of whether that conduct is generally covered by the criminal law, then where the, there is a motivation of prejudice, then in those circumstances that should be as required by states which are parties to that convention to be made a criminal offence. Uh, you see in the case of the European Court that it's required uh, that where you have a motivation uh, linked to the personal characteristics of the victim, that this requires a specific response on the part of the criminal justice system, particularly where you have cases of violence. And the leading case perhaps on this is the case of Inded and Toba against Georgia, where the court said treating violence and brutality with a discriminatory intent on an equal footing with cases that have no such overturns will be turning a blind eye to the specific nature of acts that are particularly destructive of fundamental rights. A failure to make a distinction in the way situations that are essentially different are handled may constitute unjustified treatment irreconcilable with Article 14 of the Convention, which is the prohibition on discrimination. So you have here um, very much the sense that the court is requiring that where you have a motivation, then, and particularly where you have acts of violence, then there should be uh, a different way of looking at it. In other words, a way which you probably treat it as a much more serious matter. So you have, um, therefore, the two elements we've talked about, hate speech and hate crime, um, but they're not completely overlapping uh, because hate speech is not concerned necessarily in all cases with things which are criminal offenses. Now, we'll see in a while that there may be circumstances in which you need to make hate speech a criminal offense, but not all hate speech needs to be tackled in that way. Uh, and that's one reason why the OSC are reluctant um, to use the term hate crime to describe hate speech, even where it is a criminal offense, as a hate crime. Um, that probably is a, an overreaction to this point, because actually, if you look at what happens in national practice, there are many countries where where you have hate speeches who's criminalized, they actually refer to it in the legislation as being hate crime. Now, the quest, the problem you've got is this tension between uh, when you've got hate speech and what action to be taken against it is how this interacts with the right to freedom of expression. Because by definition, in a way, uh, when you're talking about hate speech, you are talking about a form of expression. And therefore you might assume that it is protected by the right to freedom of expression in, for example, um, Article 10 of the European Convention. But when you look at the case law of the European Court, it takes two approaches uh, when dealing with 
what is seen uh, as hate speech. And of course, what you have to bear in mind, in most of the cases, the court is concerned with whether or not the action taken by the state to sanction a particular expression is consistent with the convention. So it's trying to just judge whether or not it's an interference with the right to freedom of expression. Now, in some cases, the, the approach the court takes is to say that certain forms of hate speech are completely outside the protection of the right to freedom of expression. They reach that conclusion by relying upon Article 17 in the convention, which is concerned with acts and activity aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms in the convention. But in many of the cases, it's not relying upon Article 17. It rather comes to the conclusion that there is potentially no violation of Article 10 because simply it relies upon the balancing of rights within Article 10. So there are two different approaches. Now, on the whole, it takes the first approach, let's say the reliance on Article 17, when you have situations where people make vehement attacks on a particular ethnic group or religious group, or make anti-Semitic statements or spread racially discriminatory statements or deny the Holocaust. Those are all cases where the court has said at various points that it's not protected by Article 10 at all. There is um, a violation. Um, there's no violation, there is no protection of the speech. A good example of this can be seen in the case of Gersild in Denmark, where you had a group of young people known as Green Jackets, who had stated in a television interview that niggers and foreign workers were animal. Uh, and this, the court said, was not protected by Article 10. And similarly, in a case against France, the Soro case, remarks referring to Muslim hordes coming from North Africa and going to our distant villages, uh, with five million now building mosques everywhere and putting veils on their arrogant girls. This was seen as something which was outside the protection of Article 10. The other approach, uh, which is a much more difficult one, because here you're looking at is there a good reason for the state taking the action? And in some instances, um, they may not reach the conclusion that the speech um, is lacking the protection of, of Article 10. It varies about the whole range of circumstances. It will take account, for example, of whether or not there is a tense political or social situation, direct or indirect calls to violence, uh, and also sweeping statements attacking or casting in a negative light entire ethnic, religious or other groups. And in particular, it worries about the manner in which the statements were made and the capacity, direct or indirect, for them to lead to harmful consequences. Now, all of these cases, the court is particularly concerned with whether the action taken in response meets the test of proportionality. And in particular, whether or not there might be less uh, draconian ways of dealing with it than the use of criminal law. So for instance, the possibility might be um, that civil remedies would be appropriate. Now going back to the Gersil case, which I mentioned earlier, that case was not actually concerned with the action taken against the um, people who spoke and said, refer to the people as being niggers. It was concerned rather with the person who made the television program um, and who was trying to um, show to Denmark that actually there was a problem of racism in the country, which needed attention. And although the court understood that um, the state has a duty to try and deal with the problem of racial discrimination. It was still the, the case that it was disproportionate to impose a criminal sanction on the maker of the television program, given his objective. Um, in some instances, um, even where the intent of the person is not clearly racist or promoting hatred, the circumstances may be such that particular action needs to be taken against him. You can see an example of this in the case of Ferre and Belgium, which concerned the distribution of leaflets uh, on behalf of a politician. And this, these leaflets presented immigrants as criminal minded and keen to exploit the benefits they derived from living in Belgium, as well as seeking to make fun of them with the inevitable risk of arousing, particularly among the less knowledgeable members of the public, feelings of distrust, rejection and hatred of foreigners. And here you see the court is particularly concerned about the, the power of influence that politicians can have uh, when they express themselves in public and that this can lead to intolerance being fostered. Um, and in the court's view, recommending solutions to immigration related problems by advocating racial discrimination was likely to cause social tension and mistrust in democratic institutions.
It accepted, therefore, that there was a compelling social need to protect the rights of the immigrant community by taking action against the politician. Again, the context in which the remarks are made is important. Uh, there was a case against Turkey, the Gunders case, in which there was an accusation of incitement to religious rather than racial hatred, uh, where someone had made a strong defense of Sharia uh, in a live television debate. But what was important in this case is which why it was not held justified to take action was it was important that the person making these remarks was counterbalanced by other people who took quite a different view on this matter in the, the debate. And this was seen as being something which comes within the whole concept of, of pluralism. And the court also said there was no deliberate attempt to spread insight or justify intolerance. Uh, so that, that was important to, to lead to the conclusion that taking action against Mr. Gundas was not justified. Um, the court is particularly concerned about the risk that flows from remarks that people make. Um, but as I said, criminal sanctions will not always be the right approach. Um, and therefore, the court will look very carefully. Uh, and in particular, if you have the use of imprisonment uh, as a sanction, it will be very um, demanding for a state to justify that. Now, it's not to say that imprisonment cannot be the appropriate response to some forms of hate speech, but the court will not accept that in every instance um, going as far as that would be appropriate. What I think is also important is, apart from the question of um, the balance between freedom of expression um, and the need to protect people who are the victims of hate speech, you, you also see the, the development of a case law where the court is beginning to recognize a positive obligation for member states to actually protect those who are targeted by the use of hate speech from any violence or any other interference with their rights. So in other words, when you have situations where hate speech is being used, the court may well be looking to see whether they take appropriate action to protect the people who are the victims. And so in the Uranio Toxo case against Greece, there was a failure to take action to protect um, a minority media organization um, from a, a form of hate speech was being used against them. And in another case against Turkey, the Aksu case against Turkey, there was a failure to, seen as a failure to provide ins redress for insulting expression. This was a case where there was negative stereotyping of an individual on the basis of his affiliation with a particular group. And the court said there was a need to take action because the right under Article 8, the right to respect for private life, uh, requires that you have some obligation to take action to ensure that people are properly respected. Now, this is much more difficult to apply in particular situations, but it, it does point to the fact that there is a growing sense in which the court will require a more active approach uh, of the state in response to the use of hate speech. And you see this in particular also in relation to the growth of online media. Uh, the leading case is Delphi against Estonia, where you had a company which set up an online uh, communication arrangement, uh, which was linked to its uh, media activity, and therefore it was particularly responsible for what was on um, the um, particular online site, uh, but actually took no action um, or very belated action where there were very hateful remarks which were posted. This is a difficult area, particularly in relation to um, internet communication, because you've got to work out whether a particular entity is really in control of the publication. And this is an argument which is, for example, used often by Facebook, that it's not responsible for what people post. Um, but I think you're beginning to see that there is some responsibility. It may not be necessarily a responsibility to to police, but there will be seen by the court a responsibility to respond where the media organization or the internet provider is aware of particular forms of hate speech. Uh, now, this comes back to the point that you have this tension between expression um, and the, the importance of the right to tolerance and respect for equal dignity. Those rights are also protected under the European Convention, uh, and therefore it's important that you take action against hate speech on this basis. But GPR number 15 recognizes that uh, 
there are a whole range of different ways in which you can tackle hate speech. And so if you look at the structure of GPR number 15, the use of the criminal sanction is very much the last resort rather than the first resort. And there are a whole range of other methods uh, which are, are important to to take action. Um, so that, that's quite vital. Um, and GPR number 15 has a graduated approach. What's this important, I think, is to always look at the context um, in which hate speech or particular speech is being used, uh, the more that there are already serious tensions within a society, the more you might need to take action. The capacity of an individual to exert influence, when this comes back to particularly political, religious and community leaders, they have particular responsibility. The nature and the strength of the language, uh, is it provocative and direct? Does it involve misinformation, negative stereotyping and stigmatization? Um, are the remarks an isolated incident or are they reaffirmed several times? Those are factors which will depend on the result. The medium which is used um, and a particular focus will be on live uh, statements because with live statements, you have the possibility of people reacting quite quickly to particular remarks. Um, and also you have to think about the nature of the audience, uh, whether or not this uh, is particularly susceptible to engage in acts of violence, intimidation, hostility or discrimination. So if you have people being exploited, and this comes back again to the point about the responsibility the pro politicians have. Um, the European Court um, recognizes that liability as a, as a criminal offense can arise for hate speech um, where uh, you have the possibility of it either being deliberately seeking to incite or it's concerned with the likelihood um, that people should have been aware of the risk that it would exacerbate tensions. And this is, a, I think, consistent with the case law of the court. In particular, if you look at the Surek and Turkey case, you will see that there. Um, also important uh, in stronger action against particular remarks will be whether the remarks are in public. Uh, the more you are in a public context, then the more there is a likelihood of strong action being being like required. Um, but the GPR in particular is quite concerned about the protection of freedom of expression. As I said, it involves a whole range of other measures, particularly education, regulation, self-regulation. Um, and criminal sanction becoming the last um, measure. Um, and that therefore also means that you have to worry that where you have criminal offenses that um, sanction the use of hate speech, you've got to be very cautious that it won't end up with those offenses being misused through prosecutions that target criticism of official policies, political opposition, or religious belief, rather than any form of hate speech. And that's very clearly stated in um, GPR number 15, that um, it's perfectly legitimate for people to criticize the government, uh, and you shouldn't be trying to turn such criticism and direct describe it as a form of hate speech. Uh, the governments may not like it, what people say about them, but they, that's part of their duty in a democratic society to tolerate such remarks. Um, and you also need to worry about proportionality. And one of the things that GPR number 15 emphasizes is that where you do have criminal offenses, you need to pay a lot of attention to uh, giving guidance to law enforcement officials and prosecutors so that they are fully aware of the risks of using particular offenses. They're, they're not actually uh, just rushing to prosecute. They need to think carefully whether they're actually going to interfere with freedom of expression. So those are the kind of issues that you have with trying to judge the balance between hate speech and protecting the right to freedom of expression. But it's important to keep in mind that, of course, those who are targeted by hate speech, um, and you see this particularly in the country monitoring that ECRI engages in, uh, they, those people suffer distress, hurt feelings, an assault upon their dignity. Uh, but it also 
and this is why it's crucial to take action against hate speech. It leads to them being subjected to discrimination, harassment, uh, and it can also lead to them feeling afraid, insecure, and intimidated. In other words, that they withdraw um, from active life in society. And that's why in GPR number 15, you see a lot of emphasis on the measures needed to protect victims. Uh, first of all, by providing support for them um, after they've experienced the use of hate speech. And after, thereafter, uh, um, other res responses, particularly when there are criminal proceedings brought um, in certain forms of counseling is seen as important. Um, but it's also important that those who are the victims of hate speech or are targeted by it have the right and are recognized as having the right to use counter speech. And indeed, speaking out against uh, hate speech is a very strong uh, element in GPR number 15, because if you have statements and they're allowed to pass unnoticed, then they tend to become mainstreamed and become something which is generally acceptable, which of course is inconsistent with the prohibition. Um, the other problem for people who are victims of hate speech, which I think is significant, is sometimes there can be difficulties for them to actually get remedies um, because they may find there are a lot of obstacles uh, and it's therefore important to ensure that access to a remedy is clearly feasible for these people um, and they should also be not be afraid of the possibility of reprisals um, because they take action against people who have used hate speech and therefore it's important that you don't have complex procedures um, and you should try to make them fairly straightforward user friendly um, and provide assistance for people who are victims of hate speech um, and one thing GPR 15 in particular emphasizes that you shouldn't have people being charged a fee for handling complaints about um, the use of hate speech. This is what some organizations, uh, private organizations as much as public organizations, sometimes try to um, charge for the use making of complaints. Um, and of course, with a complaints mechanism, it's, it's very important that there be effective action to investigate. Uh, and in some instances, and this was a problem in the Eden Toba case, is the question of whether or not you treat the particular remarks as a serious matter, or you try to trivialize it by using a much lesser criminal offense, and that would be inconsistent with the duty that is owed under the convention. Um, one of the things which GPR number 15 emphasizes in recommendation number four is the need for specific prompt and unqualified condemnation of the actual use of hate speech. Uh, this is important not simply because its use is entirely unacceptable in a democratic society, but also because it otherwise will reinforce, you will not reinforce the values on which such a democratic society is based. So how to speech is, is particularly important. Um, and Therefore, all users of the media in any form should be encouraged to draw attention to instances in which hate speech is being used to make clear their objection to such use. Now, the GPR underlines that this is a responsibility of everyone, so we all have this particular responsibility, but it emphasizes in particular the responsibility of public figures because they can make an especially important contribution because they of the esteem in which they should be held and they give their voice gives a particular influence um, and so it's important that they as well as personalities in the arts business and sports speak out when they hear or see hate speech being used because the more you're silent the more you're likely to legitimize it um, so condemnation is needing something which has to be ma mainstreamed and one of the problems in politics is this failure often for people to speak out and you see this in many parliaments where no one actually says anything about uh, remarks which are clearly a form of hate speech uh, in the course of parliamentary debates the one of the features which gpr number 15 emphasizes is the importance of self-regulation and this is particularly important in institutions like parliaments um, that if they you, rather than try to use criminal action in, in, against people who say use remarks which are likely to incite people to hatred better to have codes of conduct which encourage 
people take action against those remarks, uh, and for instance, in, in the Parliament, to have within the Parliament uh, a clear uh, internal rule that hate speech is is unacceptable and therefore the, the people who use it should be sanctioned within uh, the, the parliamentary system. And the GPR number 15, therefore, has particularly encouraged political parties to sign the Charter of European Political Parties for a non-racist society. Um, the acceptance of, of this charter by political parties not only entails an acknowledgement by them of their particular responsibilities as actors in a democratic political process, but it should also <coughs> provide leadership for others in demonstrating that there is a need to tackle the use of hate speech. Unfortunately, if you look at the more recent period, that's exactly what hasn't been happening. I mean, you've come back to the question of coronavirus. We see um, many existing prejudices being inflamed and new ones encouraged for example, by referring to the virus as the China or Wuhan virus by the President of the United States and his Secretary of State and remarks by similar persons. Uh, in other countries, politicians have been suggesting that migrants, refugees and Muslims are responsible for bringing in and spreading the virus. Those are clearly hate forms of hate speech. And in others, politicians have been reinforced stereotypes with statements such as the one that a particular politician in Italy said that that country would cope better than China in dealing with the virus on account of culturally strong attributes to hygiene, washing hands and taking showers, where everyone, this is a quote, had seen the Chinese eating mice alive. Um, that was, of course, a, a rather unrealistic um, hope that Italy would avoid uh, the serious problems of coronavirus. But the more important point for our purpose is this, this reinforcement of strong cultural prejudices. Um, and you see, um, therefore, when you, these remarks are made by senior public figures, um, that this is capable of um, releasing inhibitions of other people to engage in um, prejudice or even violent conduct against people belonging to minorities. Uh, and adopting measures to tackle hate speech is not always seen as desirable in countries that have experienced authoritarian or totalitarian political systems. Certainly those who have lived through it are worried about the prospect of legislation in this field being used to stifle political dissent. And this is not an unfounded fear, as hate speech laws have been invoked to attack political criticism and the promotion of ideas that run against the dominant culture. A good example of this can be seen in the judgment in Stomachin against Russia in respect of the sanction imposed on remarks that were merely concerned with criticism of the state and the actions of the federal armed and security forces as part of the machinery of the state. And the court stressed in this case that it was vitally important that the domestic authorities adopt a cautious approach in determining the scope of hate speech, um, particularly hate speech crimes, and strictly construe the relevant provisions in order to avoid excessive interference under the guise of action taken against hate speech, where really such charges being brought for mere criticism of the government, state institutions, and their policies and practices. So the risk of abuse is definitely there, but th that risk is not an argument against taking action against hate hate speech because taking action doesn't require that you use criminal sanctions in all issues. Criminalization of hate speech is the last and not the first resort and other measures should be used. Another difficulty that, uh, that I've seen in many countries when suggestions are raised about introducing laws concerned with hate speech or expanding the scope of existing ones is the reluctance to recognize the full range of personal characteristics which are listed in GPR number 15 because such recognition is politically or culturally divisive. This is regrettable because the use of hate speech has an intimate relationship with the discrimination faced by many people, both in encouraging it and making it seem legitimate. At the same time, putting in place effective hate speech legislation is probably more important than this having, like our GPR number 15, a comprehensive character. Where there is effective legislation covering some grounds, there is more likely to be an appreciation that the fundamentals of equality cannot be limited to just some persons with a particular characteristic. So you can build on the particular blocks. Um, and as the European Court said in the Vigilant case against Sweden, um, in its own jurisprudence, it initially placed particular emphasis on discrimination based on race, origin, or color. But in that case, it came to appreciate that discrimination based on sexual orientation was just as serious.
So by way of conclusion, it should be recalled that hate speech standards such as those in GPR number 15 and the case law of the European Court are not hostile to or inconsistent with the right to free expression. Indeed, as I already noted, this, the recognition of the fundamental importance of the right to, uh, to freedom of expression is one of the starting points. However, the right to freedom of expression must also take account of the equally fundamental importance of tolerance and respect for equal dignity, which requires the use of hate speech to be effectively tackled, whether by criminal law or by other means. Thank you very much.